Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Uhuru Palafala, and I will be the chair of the next session, which I am delighted to welcome you to. Um, the panel is titled Queer and Gendered Performativity, and uh, the program reflects that we will have three um, presenters. However, our third presenter, Mwegezi Kwahela, is unfortunately unable to make it uh, due to some personal reasons. So for this panel, we will have two no, presenters. We... Hi. Oh, you are here. That's not me, no, that's someone else. <laughs> My sincerest apologies. No, I think, I think it, I'm not sure who it is, but uh, Dr. Moji informed you, but yeah, I'm here. That's not me, sorry. I am so sorry. <laughs> I see fine, you, brother, you are here and I acknowledge you. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize. That's Please fine, no. <laughs> So actually, it is uh, our second presenter, Dumi Mampani, who is not here <laughs> today. So we do have um, Kellen Buota and we have Mwekezi Kwaela, uh, who will uh, be presenting their papers. And I will give you 20 minutes each, and then we should have uh, sufficient time at the end for some Q and A. So I ask that um, uh, anyone who's got um, questions, please just post them in the chat, and you also have the opportunity to ask them uh, during Q and A um, through through um, switching on your mics. So thank you for being here, and I now hand over to Kellen. Uh, Buota, who's going to be presenting on why are filmmakers so fixated on women's penises? All right. Um, welcome, Kelly. Hello, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, can everybody hear me, see me, everything good? Yes. Yes. Wonderful. In 2019, I embarked on a dissertation. Uh, for the Wits University Film and TV Department uh, for my master's, entitled, Why are filmmakers so fixated on women's penises? An analysis of the recurrent focus on genitalia of transgender women in film. My choice of title was deliberate. I wanted to provoke and to embody the spirit of that now increasingly common phrase, trans women are women. The project, however, does not delve deeply into the modes of meaning and knowledge that construct and validate the femaleness of trans women. The debate over the specific semantics and definitions of womanhood and where trans women fit into that are, in my experience, an endless hole into which we as trans women are pulled by those who would rather bicker than validate our lived realities. Writing about intercultural cinema in 2000, however, Laura Marx stated, questions of form cannot be separated from the political conditions in which these works are produced. Marx's statement holds true for all forms of media, including this dissertation. So in other words, I may not be taking the time to argue why we should consider trans women to be women, but my positionality as a trans woman, as a trans woman from South Africa, informs this work. Trans issues are more than an intellectual debate in academia. The topic is a major preoccupation in quote unquote, Western culture, but few film critics seem to fully examine cinema's recurrent demonstration of trans people despite their diversity and vulnerability. It is this very lack of diversity in representations of trans people, which I take issue with, and which has led me to critique several films 
specifically through their attitude towards the trans feminine penis due to the pervasiveness and repetitiveness of representations of trans women's genitalia, I embarked on this project. The fixation on the feminine penis can perhaps be attributed to a pre-existing misapprehension in the societies which produce and consume such media of transgender identity being innately linked somehow to genitalia. The obsession may also stem from the widespread belief that transgender women medically transition or express their gender identity as some sort of fetish or as a means of conning heterosexual men into sexual relations. The fetishistic view is largely linked to the now controversial diagnosis of autogynephilia. Proposed by medical theorists such as Dr. Ray Blanchard, this theory, largely discredited today, posits that trans women, perhaps if not explicitly seeking sex with men under false pretenses, are merely attempting to look at themselves in a sexual manner, unable to get close to the women they desire. Another view, that of the predatory trans person, is still evident in public debates surrounding trans women's rights to access public bathrooms. And such debates are present in depictions of trans women in film. All of these theories presume that medically transitioning from one gender expression to another is somehow innately linked to sex, innately linked to the penis the Freudian symbol of sexual and physical power, causing anxiety and fear in the public and filmmakers perception of what would otherwise be considered mere genitals. I looked then at three films regarding trans women as their central characters at roughly two decade intervals, a core sample, if you will, the way Antarctic climate researchers do by digging into the ice. I wanted to find out if these anxieties, if these underlying rationales for why trans people exist and present themselves the way they do uh, have eased over time. Perhaps the ever increasing mainstreaming of trans identities and advocacy in politics and the media would have caused this. My dissertation extensively dissects and problematizes these three films as well as offers a cultural context for them. I rely on thinkers such as Foucault and Derrida to justify my particular brand of analysis. I rely on Julia Kristeva and her work on abjection to explain why perhaps society has such an aversion to the transgender body. I rely on Julia Serrano, whose work, Whipping Girl, the scapegoating of femininity, explains to me so eloquently why trans women are at once mocked and feared. As mentioned above, I also rely on Freud, despite the fact that, for lack of a more eloquent phrasing, the man wrote an awful lot of BS. I rely on Freud because his ideas have shaped our world and the worldviews of people, including filmmakers. He also does offer tools like them or not, for neatly understanding some of these issues. But in writing this thesis, I found that so many of the so-called experts on transgender representation in cinema, cisgender men from the global north, appear to have only the barest comprehension of what transgender people even are to begin with. For example, in one film, The Crying Game, which I'll touch on later, uh, the author of a book entitled Transgender in Film, wrote that the main character couldn't possibly be transgender because she hadn't undergone surgery and surgery did exist in the 90s to uh, get rid of the penis. The fact that uh, this character is a hairdresser who would not have the financial means to access this kind of surgery. The fact that many trans people do not try to even perform or pursue these surgeries 
because of accessibility or because they are perfectly happy with their bodies never crosses this man's mind. I rely on these people to give my work the veneer of respectable academic writing, to show that I have done my reading and the work to warrant the degree that Witz has now bestowed upon me. But the work is mine. The thoughts are mine, not theirs. I chose the title to provoke because I'm angry that I am represented in these films that depict my body as inherently grotesque, as inherently deceptive. In that context, the findings themselves are less relevant than the reason for writing in the first place. But briefly, the first film I looked at, Myra Breckenridge from 1970, follows the titular Myra as she seeks revenge on her family and all men by undergoing surgery and infiltrating her uncle's acting school. She rapes a young man and indoctrinates the youth into anti-male radical agenda. The fear and anxieties of growing feminism, of emasculation of your traditional man, and the relatively recent and growing trend of surgical procedures for trans women, which makes those fears a seeming reality, are all too clear in this 50 plus year old satire. The second film, The Crying Game, which I've mentioned before, is perhaps the most analyzed piece of trans media in history. It follows the Irish militant Fergus, who learns that the woman he is enamored with is actually transgender. Upon seeing her penis, Fergus famously hits her out of instinct and vomits. Later, still not quite at peace with the situation, the two protagonists' futures are left vague. It is not an insensitive portrayal. It is, uh, in fact, a movie I do quite enjoy personally. But here we see the anxieties shift away from those of social collapse to the personal anxieties of straight men who dare not contemplate that they might be gay. The final film, Boy Meets Girl from 2014, is by far the most uh, progressive, one might say. It is a typical American rom-com where the boy and the girl get together after a love triangle forms in their small town. It's sweet. Many trans people like it because it's not like so many other films outright violent toward them. But of course, I managed to dig into this too. The way that even in this sweet, wholesome movie, the trans girl's penis remains a central plot point where no other film in this genre would be so explicit about a young woman's genitalia. And the way that the main love interest, Robbie, considers all anal sex to be gay by definition, shows that we still have a long way to go before trans women are treated on screen as anyone else. In other words, I wouldn't argue that stereotypical problematic presentations of trans women have lessened over the last five decades so much as I would argue they have evolved with the times. Certain outright transphobia may no longer be uh, present in cinema, just as a lot of overt racism and sexism and homophobia is no longer present in most media. Doesn't mean it's not there. So why did I focus on three Global North English language main stream films. What is the relevance to us here at Africa Feminisms? As South African universities strive toward a decolonized syllabus, this focus on only a few Western cinema samples may seem regressive, and perhaps it is, but our globalized worldview is still very influenced by those Western powers and that Western media. As such, it would be naive to claim that Western films are irrelevant in the South African context. Aside from tabloid newspapers, TV news, and a handful of documentaries, fictional characters such as we saw a few years ago on Sia Vindalan, representations of trans people in South Africa are scarce. Thus, most South African cinema goers, movie lovers, are going to be exposed to trans people and characters through Western media. Black African trans women face disproportionate violence in South Africa, 
as a result of the pervasiveness of colonial systems of racial and sexual oppression and control in its collective culture. Although there are no exact statistics, a large number of transgender and other LGBTI plus persons have died violently in South Africa over the last five years, many of whom were known personally to me or my peers. I actually wrote that paragraph uh, before 2021 and the number has grown quite terrifyingly over the past 12 months. Thus, to better understand how such brutality is affected by or affects trans representation is, I believe, immensely valuable. In closing, I would like to make a note on healing uh, in line with the theme of this year's conference, because part of my project involved not only research and writing my dissertation, but also to actually create a short film of my own, which is now uh, which has now screened at the Josie Film Festival, SA Indie Film Festival, Amgungundlovu LGBT Film Festival, Global Indie Film Festival, and the Geneva LGBT Film Festival. Uh, I didn't think it would be screened anywhere, so I'm hugely honored and privileged that so many places have picked it up. Obviously, I had to make a film about a trans woman that stayed clear of the stereotypes that I highlight in my dissertation, so no genitalia at all. But beyond that, it had to be a film about something through various drafts and edits and discussions with uh, my supervisor, Dr. Ndukam Tambo from WITS. Quite accidentally, the film became about me. And it was more cathartic than I could have imagined. In it, I discussed the disconnect between being an activist who wants to fight and being a middle-class white girl who just wants a quote-unquote normal life. I talk about what I've gained by coming out and about everything that I've lost. And I do a little educating on trans issues as well. So in closing, I want to say that the power of film, of creating and telling your own stories as individuals of marginalized demographics, rather than waiting for the mainstream to catch up with our knowledge and our politics, is an immensely valuable tool and process that I hope more people will explore in dealing with their own traumas and in educating the public. And it is a tool that I do hope to explore a lot more in any future work I may happen to do. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, uh, Kelly Broda. Um, and now I have the pleasure of welcoming uh, and his paper is titled how is masculinity perform how is masculinity performed amongst male university students welcome uh, Mwekezi. Uh, thank you uh, Uhuru uh, and uh, thank you to my colleague as well uh, Kevin for a powerful presentation uh, good afternoon, ladies, gentlemen, and other trans, non-binary, gender-fluid identities and bodies and spirits who are joining us this afternoon for this panel session on queer and gendered performativity. Um, my name is Mwekezi Gordon Guahela, a self-identifying Black homosexual gay male whose topic for today will be how is masculinity performed among male university students, a case study of Vets University's all-male residents. The work forms part of my MA research report paper that I have been reading and researching towards from 2018 uh, till now. Uh, and important to note is that um, I resided at this particular residence that I'm researching uh, for six years from when I joined as a freshman in 2014 during my undergraduate years uh, until 2019 when I left uh, as a senior postgrad student um, at Wits University. And the research was conducted uh, in the years uh, 2018 to 2020, and now at the final stages uh, of submitting. So in the project, I spoke with men from different social backgrounds in order to understand issues relating to men's unhealthy or toxic behaviors. And I did this in order to seek out solutions for social ills in the everyday experiences of various groups, including children, women, and gender fluid persons, 
in their everyday lived experiences. Uh, however, because this research um, was specifically conducted in a university space, it is particularly the experiences of women and other trans, non-binary, gender fluid and identities and bodies that are more relevant as they're the ones who exist in the space as opposed to children. Uh, moreover, I do this through a study of the Men's Hall of Residence at Wits University. And the specific methodology that I use to carry out my research is autoethnography that I chose because of its ability to make room for allowing myself as a researcher to incorporate my own lived experiences in the field. Uh, later on during my presentation, uh, I do employ the same method, autoethnography, to turn in, uh, inward as well uh, and look at the self, uh, which is myself, through a critical lens beyond uh, an individualized experience of this residence, uh, to reflect as well on my positionality at the residence that allowed me to negotiate my identity and move in certain ways that made my time at the residence um, easier. Uh, through negotiation uh, as stated. So what attracted me to apply for this conference was because of the title uh, In Search of Our Shrines, uh, Feminist Healing and the Politics of Love. And you know, the particular words that really stood out for me was, you know, searching, feminist healing and love. And I wondered what it might mean for men to search for their shrines to heal and love in more inclusive and nonviolent ways. Alternatively, for men like myself who consider themselves feminist and progressive, how to take initiative instead of waiting to be invited in healing ourselves. Moreover, you know, I thought about how can we create space for men who are largely affected by what Angela Davis uh, calls men's problems, uh, such as domestic violence, intimate violence, sexual violence, and gender violence. And because uh, you know, terms are not always understood the same across context, uh, whereas Angela Davis talks about uh, gender violence in our South African context, you know, we normally term it as gender-based violence uh, you know, that society has constructed as women's problems. However, uh, you know, Angela Davis argues that they are in fact men's problems because we are the ones who perpetuate them. I thus hope that my research and writing of this work will significantly contribute to an intersectional feminist work at a theoretical, practical, but importantly as well, a creative uh, outlet as well. And I think that links to really the purpose of my work, which is not only to add to the existing bodies of, of knowledge on masculinity studies that have been done by authors such as, you know, Kopano Ratele, Malusi Langa, Peace uh, Kigwa, who is joining us, uh, and also, I think what I'm also just trying to, to do for myself in this research is to, because of where the research site is located, right, which is a, an exclusive male space at a South African public university, for me, what makes studying this site particularly important is to fill in some gaps that exist in our current understandings of men's residences in South Africa. And additionally, I seek to add to a growing abundance of studies done in higher education research scholarship, looking at gendered experiences in public universities, especially in light of the anti-rape uh, culture protests that have taken place in VITS, UCT, Rhodes, um, and many other public uh, South African universities that has been noted by writers such as Barbara Boswell, Sandy Lendelu, and Simam Kele Lakavu, who compiled you know, an excellent journal uh, through their gender platform uh, that had a special issue reflecting on issues of gender, sexuality, and race in higher education. So just to provide context to Men's Hall of Residence. Um, so when you, when you enter Men's Hall of Residence, or when I entered in 2014, one of the first things that you learn during initiation or orientation week uh, is an anthem. And uh, it's called, uh, uh, to recite it, it goes as follows. Uh, Hello, hello, have you ever heard about the boys in red and white? Our famous name says we are the best, the one and only men's residence. Who are we, men's res? What are we, animals? And uh, I'd like to play a video here to show the men singing um, the song. Uh, hopefully I will be able to do it. Um,
And uh, that really uh, took place uh, when the Men's Hall of Residence uh, visited um, their sister residence, uh, and it's called uh, Jubilee, which I will also reflect on as uh, one of, uh, when, I, when I get into my findings. Um, so in essence, Men's, Men's Hall of Residence is made up of two houses, uh, College House, which was built in 1920, and Darumpel, uh, Darumpel House, which was built in 1922. And in essence, my beginning to reside at Men's, at Men's Hall of Residence really started after I was informed about my successful application to reside at the residence when I applied to study at VITS. And there is no formal interview that takes place with the house administrators, uh, such as the accommodation officers or the house committee. Now, the house committee is basically an elected body of male students, uh, 11 male students who are in essence, they're students themselves, they're part of student leadership, right? So these are the men that we are, who initiate us into coming into the residence and teach us the traditions and the oral history of the residence. And they're the ones who, in, who are in, in essence tasked with, with telling you or teaching you how to be a man at, at men's residence. And also one of the other first things that you learn when you come into men's residence is the whole issue of hierarchy, right? So when you're a first year, you're referred to as a freshman. When you're a second year, you're referred to as a senior freshman. When you are a third year, you're referred to as a proper senior. When you are doing fourth year, which would be your honors, you are referred to as a fossil. And when you are someone like myself who does a master's up until your PhD, or if you've been there from uh, five years upwards, you're referred to as an ancestor. So uh, I apologize. May I jump in here and sorry to, to cut your flow. We were not able to see or hear the video. Were oh. you able to see and hear it on your side? Yeah. Okay, no, we were not able to, to see it. So could you just try again? Uh, sorry okay. about that. Can you see my screen? Yes, now we can. Uh, wait, I just wanna, sorry. Can you hear it? Cannot hear it, but can see it. So cannot hear it. Yeah, it's fine, it's fine. I'll just keep it moving and uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Apologies about that. No, it's fine. I just think for time purposes, yeah. I'll just, yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Wait, can you still see my screen? Oh, yeah. Yes. Now you can see it. <laughs> now we can't. <laughs> um, so in essence, really, one of the, so just to get back to my train of thought. So in essence, the residence has a number of anthem songs, which was what I was trying to show with the video, right? And in essence, there, there, there are certain songs that you are taught about, monuments that you're taught about that form part of the traditions informing the culture of men's residence. In essence, this is what we subscribe to as men uh, uh, who live at the residence in order to successfully perform uh, our manhood, right? And in essence, the manhood is based on the whole concept of being a raider, right? So that's the quintessential manhood that you're supposed to aspire to. So Cornell speaks about, you know, uh, hegemonic masculinity. So at Men's Hall of Residence, the hegemonic masculinity that you're taught to aspire to is the whole concept of being a raider, right? And the word raider is also used interchangeably at the residence uh, to, in essence, we are animals. Hence, part of the anthem includes uh, the whole notion that we are animals, right? And then, of course, later on, I also reflect on the word animals and how, for example, because currently the residence is a predominantly Black space uh, by having a lot of Black students, uh, th there's a certain section in which I, I also pro problematize the word animals, given the fact that most of the people that I interviewed were predominantly uh, Black. So the critical markers of being a raider, right, this man that you're supposed to aspire to at men's uh, residents are uh, basically the key characteristics that you're supposed to be as a reader is that you're supposed to 
drink alcohol, you're supposed to smoke, you're supposed to eat meat, and you're also supposed to engage uh, in sexual activity, right? And in essence, uh, also dating a lot of uh, females, right? And one of my interviews uh, that I held with uh, a gentleman by the name of Nkosi, who is 24 at the time, he's Black, uh, he's Zulu, and he was a senior student at the time of my interviewing him. Um, and I asked him, you know, what does it mean to be a man at men's res? What makes a real, a, a raider at men's hall of residence? And he responded in Zulu, and I will translate, and he said, you know, and in essence, to translate it, it is basically you're supposed to smoke, you're supposed to drink, drink beer, you're supposed to eat meat and have lots and lots of sex, right? And he goes on to say, you're also supposed to get into fights and brawls, you know, you must be number one when they say they're fighting. Plus, there are also those 10 commandments, the raider commandments, thou shall steal, thou shall drink black label, Oh, another thing, you must support soccer and you must be a fan of soccer, rugby. It is mostly soccer, rugby, and cricket comes second, but you must support them and not watch things like soapies like Seven Dilan, Skim Sam, uh, which are South African local soapy dramas that my colleague Kelly also mentioned um, in her presentation, right? So going back to the radio commandments that you subscribe to when you're a man at men's residence, and for me, what is also just interesting is that, especially when, when you go back to the one of thou shall drink, right? There's a specific drink that you're actually supposed to drink at men's res as part of your initiation or as part of, or, or to, if you want to be regarded as, as a real man and it's drinking strictly Culling Black Label, right? So Culling Black Label is basically a, a beer brand in South Africa, right? So you're, you're only supposed to drink Black Label, no other drinks, you're supposed to support, you know, sports, like soccer, rugby, and all those things, right? And also I think one of the things that I think should be noted is that in addition for, you know, to being a tool for creating a sense of camaraderie, right? Um, some of the activities uh, are used as a form of punishment, especially for first year students or for freshmen, right? In case they might challenge the house committee. And one of the interviews that I held with one of the, uh, the students there who has a house committee, uh, when, when I asked him, you know, why do you guys, you know, have these set of activities as part of being a man at men's rest? And he responded by saying, and his name is Umfundisi, he's also a black male who at the time of interviewing him was 24. Uh, he's Tosa and was a senior student. And he said to me, through hard activity, you know, when we say they should do push-ups, when they sing together, that's when they become one. Same thing as I say, even in the mountains, we expect boys to sing and do hard labor. It is not abuse, you must understand. Same thing as football players. At some point, they have to do hard activities like running, right? And for me, what was quite interesting with Mfundis's response was that he was able to make a link between his own initiating at men's, at men's residence with his experience of initiation, right? So he's Tosa, right? And he was able to say that, no, what we are teaching, so, and he was part of house and what, what he was saying was that, what we're doing here is what is done in mountains, is, is what is done in training such as soccer trainings in the country, right? So he's making a link between men's residence and men. So in essence, being a, a man is about doing hard labor, right? Being seen to be tough, right? And another theme that I would also like to reflect on was the relationship with female residences, right? That is really based on this whole concept of heteronormativity. So one of the things that I discovered as part of my research is that the men's res, for example, has sister residence, has a sister uh, in relationship with another female residence at Vets called uh, Jubilee, right? So they refer to Jubilee as their sister residence. And they also have, a, in essence, a, a, a pledge or an anthem or a song that they, that they dedicate to Jubilee. Uh, and I wanted to play a video, but because uh, we're having technical glitches, I'm just gonna read it out. And in essence, I, I, I try and look at how, for example, some of the anthems and traditions at men's res, I try to see how those traditions and, ethem, and, and, and anthems in, in essence are about how men at the residence, they view, talk and interact with women. 
and other trans non-binary gender fluid identities that they come across. And the anthem goes as follows. Men's res is red, Jubilee is blue. Tonight we pledge our love to you, even though Sunnyside is closer and JSC better looking. We promise to make time for you, even though some of you may charge. Jubilee or oh Jubilee, you look as delicious as my dining hall chicken, Jubilee. Jubilee, Jubilee, we promise to make loving you our special assignment. We love you with our hearts and our other hearts, right? And in essence here, there's a certain way in which when I interacted with the men uh, through participant observation and I would ask, you know, why do we sing this anthem, right? And it, the anthem in essence is about how, for example, you know, as much as Jubilee is regarded as a sister residence, but then the men are also encouraged to, in essence, be, you know, make moves on the ladies or the female students who reside at Jubilee, right? For example, they also make a comparison between the female residences. So Sunnyside is another uh, female residence at Vitz. Uh, JSC is also another female residence located in Parktown at Vitz. So in essence, you know, men are, men are encouraged to, in essence, find relationships in these residences as part of being a real man, right? You know, you must have lots of girlfriends. Remember, the whole intention is also of you making, having lots and lots of sex. So you're encouraged as being a raider to make sure that, in essence, you're raiding everything, everything that you come across, you're destroying as part of being a man at men's res, right? Another thing, and, and this was for me particularly evident when I interviewed one of the other students by the name of Simpiwe, who is also black, he's Zulu, and he identifies as a heterosexual uh, student. And he made his remarks to the effect that you come here, and especially here where they make Ubudota, Ubudota is manhood, um, a physical thing, which is actually not. You are a man based on how many hearts you break, based on how many women you sleep with. I was trying so hard to fit in the environment I found myself having multiple sex partners because that is what the place, men's residence, basically teaches you. And this in Piwe, in essence, reflects what the anthem is about or his aspirations to become a real raider, right? By making sure that, um, in essence, that he has engages in multiple sex partners uh, and also, you know, breaks many women's hearts in these female residences. And the third theme that I want to reflect on that I was particularly interested in, especially as I had interviews with the men, was the relationship between themselves as sons, right? And also their fathers. So one of the questions that I asked in my research is that I wanted to understand how, for example, growing up, can they, I wanted for them, for the men to unpack for me what was their understanding of what it meant to be a man growing up, right? What were they taught by society or the societies they grew up in, whether township, rural, urban, suburbia? What were they taught growing up, what to do, what to express, what to say, and what to show that they are a man or that you are a man, or what does it mean to be a man? And at the same time, I was also interested in what were they taught by the very same society growing up regarding what not to do, what not to say, what not to express, in essence, what is the opposite of what you're supposed to do to prove that you are a man. And in examining the relationship of fatherhood to manhood, um, I focused on two matters, right? The role of domestic violence in South African homes with boy children. And second, I wanted to understand, or yeah, I wanted to understand how, how boys model violent male behaviors, particularly from their fathers, right? If they were in fact, if for example, there was a domestic violence case from their homes, right? And some of the men spoke about childhood experiences and hence I, I was particularly interested in, in exploring the theme. And one of the men that I interviewed talked about how for him, and I quote, to be honest, growing up learning how to be a man for me was very difficult because people I expected to guide me were actually not present. I am talking about my grandfather who was not present, but instead disappointed me. Same thing with my father, he also disappointed. At home, I didn't have an uncle, I only had female individuals. My two aunts, my grandmother, and mother. So my whole life I was raised by Abantu Besfazani. And Abantu Besfazani is in essence an expression in Zulu, 
and translated, it basically means that he was raised by female, uh, uh, by, by women uh, in his life, right? But also at the same time, it was quite interesting for me how for him, manhood was equated with being or having a male figure in his presence. So uh, I remember particularly this interview and I asked him, but then I'm like, the, the woman in your lives, like were they not, were they no any, like they didn't have like, did they not have like male partners uh, who for example, could teach you how to be a man or did you not think that the woman in your lives could teach you how to be a man? And I remember him vividly say, no, like for him, he expected his grandfather and his uncles and his father who was alive and actually is present but absconded uh, to teach him uh, how manhood was, right? So there was a sense in which some of the men at, that I interviewed, you know, for example, some of the senior students were in essence, I found used as like substitutes filling voids of, of the past, right? So some of the, the senior students were seen as like father figures, as brotherly figures, right? As part of being a man at men's res, right? And also one of the things that I also talked about with this particular interview was what caused him you know, to model violent behavior, right? When he was at the residence, because there was a section, there was a part during our interview where he talked about the fact that you know, he was involved in a whole lot of, 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 of physical fights, right? And he, respond, he responded to me by saying, yeah, you know, a whole lot of physical, I was involved in a whole lot of physical fights and I was involved uh, in those a lot last year. And last year was 2018. Well, when I conducted the interview last year in this context it would have been 2018. You know, you fight for just for the sake of fighting because you are a raider because of the men that were never in my life. You see it so detrimental that as a person you end up craving attention even from places you, you do not really need attention from, you see. And he continues by um, saying- Mwekesi, can I ask you to just offer uh, one final kind of closing uh, cool. comment because you've run out of time and I had yeah. already given you 25 minutes. Yeah, no, that's fine. Uh, okay. I will close with, for example, um, a theme of resistance. And I explored this resistance theme, especially to incorporate the voices of other trans non-binary gender fluid identities. And in essence, for what, what I wanted to find out from uh, you know, those who were part of the LGBTQ plus I community at men's residence, how did they identify with the manhood? And for them, they were largely, so they resisted the manhood at, 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 men's, at men's residence because they were also silenced. So they protested by, for example, dress, right? By choosing particular kinds of dress in order to resist uh, the manhood at, at, at men's residence. And just to quote one of them, uh, who is, his name is Muso, who is gender non-conforming, identifies as gender non-conforming. And he says, you know, it reminds me of this day where I think it was the week when Ima Digizela Mandela passed away. So it was the whole wear a dupe head, headscarf thing. I asked one of my friends from Sunnyside to borrow me Ikriya, which is a head wrap. So I'm wearing the hand wrap, uh, the head wrap, and I got this trench coat, made it tight and put on my lipstick and my friend's glasses. And I walk out, even though I didn't have heels by then. And when I got there, I was coming, walking down the stairs and I see this group of guys as I'm approaching, really staring at me. I hear them say, is that a nigger? And I was like, yes, confuse the straights. And I bust out laughing, you see. I mean, clothes have no gender and they shouldn't. Clothes are just clothes. It's just a fucking item. It's a way to express yourself. And if I was feeling like I want to be that, be that bitch today, I will put on my heels and strut my stuff. And in essence, this speaks to how, for example, the LGBTQI members that I interviewed at the residence, their experiences were in essence about resisting the particular the, the, the hegemonic masculinity at men's res of being a raider. So I'll just leave it there for now and hopefully some things are addressed during the Q&A. Yes, thank you very much. Um, may I ask uh, Kelin to come on? Please switch your, your video on. And now I open the floor. I welcome um, questions in the chat and uh, you can use the raise hand function. Um, let me see, we have two questions here. 
Dinal Lechacha says, it's interesting how bonding is justified through these rituals that are quite aggressive. I think uh, uh, she's talking to Mwegetzi's paper. Bonding um, rituals are quite aggressive. Um, keen to hear more about the ethical aspect of your research and how you navigate this, these. Let me take a, a second question. It's from Orata Chengeta, and they say, thank you both very much for really informative research. I have a question for Mwegezi. Are there any institutional interventions that have attempted to promote less toxic forms of masculinity, for instance, presentation talks by the gender equity office? If so, how are these generally received? That's the first question. Um, and the, well, the first, the first question from Horata, the second question from Horata says, how do initiations such as these continue? Do they happen underground or are they allowed by the university and performed openly? Have there been any interventions by vets regarding initiations? Mm. Um, so with regards to uh, Gorata's first question, uh, with regards to uh, institutional interventions, so there are institutional uh, uh, interventions, and in fact, um, the gender equity office uh, does come to men's res, and in fact, they, they normally like to come during initiation week and also during the, during the, the, the second semester. And for me, in the, in the times that they've been there and I've attended their talks, there's always been a backlash between, in fact, the gender equity office and the presentation that they actually come with to talk with the men at men's res and what the men, so in essence, the, the men deem it as, as an attack. And I remember attending one of the sessions that was presented by, I think she's a, she's a lawyer at gender equity office and she, she crafted the presentation Beautifully, uh, it was a beautiful presentation, I thought, but the men thought, you know, it, 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 in, in essence, it, you know, it, it attacked them as men. And they, in fact, said that the reason why they uh, shut themselves out from these conversations that, that happen at a university level that are trying to address, for example, uh, gender based violence and, uh, you know, feminist issues in, 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 in essence, they're like, but then we're always perceived as the perpetrators, right? So for me, there are there are institutional interventions, but then my chat has always been about, I just wish that the gender equity office could in fact, I don't know, make their presentations less formal and make them practical, for example, to the men of men's res, right? Because generally the, the men take it as, as an attack on them. And I feel like this, this there's a friction, like the relationship, there's a contentious relationship between the gender equity office and men's hall of residence, because I think both parties come to the conversation with preconceived notions of each other. And it also doesn't help that the men of men's residence, because already they want to be seen as unruly, as, as wild, as, as raiders, you know, theirs is, theirs is theirs. So they won't be told what to do, right? And on your second question on how do these initiations such as these continue. I think for me, what I've discovered with my research is that they continue because of each elective housecom that's elected. So as part of housecom, when you are elected, you are in essence entrusted to pass down the tradition. That is why at some point, at some point, I think in my second year, I tried to run for housecom because as a senior student, you, could, you can run for housecom. And well, that didn't go well for me because I was met with, you know, violence and homophobia and so on. And, you, you know, but for me, they, they continue, initiations continue because of the elective house comm, because the previous house comm in charges the incoming house comm with continuing the traditions. Um, and they don't happen underground. In fact, they happen, you know, quite openly, visibly. If you go to initiation week or all week or this open day, you know, each residence has like a, a designated area during the open day session and you know, the men will come there and they will sing. Sometimes they choose to attend, sometimes they don't attend. And attending, not attending is them saying, we won't be told what, what you know, we are management. You know, men's residents like to consider themselves as they are management, 
right? So to be quite honest, the interventions that have been, that have been implemented by this or try to be implemented by this, for me, I feel like it, there isn't a coherent strategy. And I think it, there needs to be a proper conversation between mental health residents, the gender equity office, student affairs, which is run by the Dean of Students, yeah. Uh, thank you, Moegetsi. Um, and so I'm going to revert you to the first question, and I will, I will bring uh, Kelly in here. I, um, I don't think you answered the question about how you navigate the ethical aspects of your research that uh, with regards to how the bonding uh, is justified through these rituals that are quite aggressive. Tiffany came in here and said, I said, I guess there's also a bonding ritual happening in the films, constituting an audience that normalizes spectacularizing women's penises. Um, so um, Kelly, I'd like to hear your thoughts about that, but there are other questions. Um, Dina, Dina says, Kellen, are there ways in which digital cultures disrupt the snail pace at which film is picking up discourses on trans women? I'm thinking here of platforms such as Instagram that enable or encourage self-representation. How can one combine that shift with film, uh, with film work? And Boriche also uh, has a question for Kellen. How do we reconcile the increased representation of trans women? How do we reconcile the increased representation of trans women in media, including films and its contributions to their hypervisibility and the violence that they are subjected to as a result? Uh, thank you. And um, sure. I think these are both I suppose questions that that I've grappled with um, more personally than than specifically in the dissertation. Um, I do touch a little bit on uh, social media as a, a democratizing tool, uh, and for an organisation that I did work with before I, I went uh, into my masters, uh, Iranti, which is a translated organisation in Johannesburg. Um, a lot of uh, the work of that organization has been uh, creating um, documentaries, uh, semi new style pieces, and also a few creative and artistic pieces um, by and for trans people and putting that out on social media, on Facebook, on YouTube. Um, and so I think it is incredibly valuable uh, that we have better access, I suppose, than ever before to platforms that allow us to tell our own stories. Um, but I think there needs to be a whole lot more introspection on the degree to which uh, this is um, having the desired effect. I think we've seen with an increased presence on social media of trans and, and queer individuals broadly, we've seen an increased backlash. Um, there is a double standard when it comes to moderating this kind of content. Um, I think a lot of LGBT people will tell you that uh, their you know, community Facebook pages are more likely to get taken down by Facebook moderators than when they report uh, outright like neo-fascist content. Um, so we have these platforms and they do, I think, benefit us, but at the same time, they are still owned by or with, operate within power structures that do not understand or take us seriously. So I think there's a lot more work to be done there in, in figuring out if it actually does benefit us. And I think that leads on to the, the other question as well about the increased representations that we see in the media and the violence that comes with that visibility. And I think a lot of the a lot of the backlash, a lot of the increase in hate crimes, a lot of the legislative attacks that we've seen in America and the UK, uh, it comes from this visibility. Uh, trans individuals have existed for as long as humans have existed, uh, albeit uh, in different 
cultural and social contexts uh, throughout the ages. And the vitriol, the backlash, the violence is increasing in tandem with this visibility. But the representation isn't going to go away. Uh, trans people are not going to go back into the closet. Um, and so it's, it can't be a discussion, I think, about do we, do we then uh, try to mitigate the backlash through less representation um, as much as sometimes one might want to uh, for one's own safety or sanity. Um, I think rather it needs to be a case of how can we use that representation? How can we mold and shift that representation uh, into uh, something that is transformative and positive and constructive? Um, the films that I analyzed, uh, and, and, and there's actually so much media that I could have analyzed, but I was told, no, just limit yourself, stick to cinema, look at that. Uh, I, I think you can you know, write something that thick uh, analyzing representation as a whole. Um, but they influence the audience. They influence other filmmakers who then go on to make their own films. And this cycle continues itself and bad representation begets bad representation, which begets bad representation, which I think influences people's attitudes, influences society, resulting in this kind of violence so if we can then, at the very least, shift that representation, it's not going to solve all the issues, um, but at least that particular cycle maybe can begin to be broken. Thanks, Kellen. Um, so I have a question here from Tiffany, which um, is a question that I was also going to ask. Um, so Tiffany says, can you talk about the ways that the dormitory uh, ritual is different from the boyhood initiation? Mm -hmm. That is, are the purposes and goals different? Isn't mountain initiation mm -hmm. about more than building an age cohort? I'm genuinely asking. Yeah. And I was also thinking, I was thinking along these lines that mm -hmm. um, I know this is your MA paper, but uh, are you also thinking about how these, these rituals mm -hmm. uh, are already established in high school, in boys' schools? There's already mm -hmm. that culture of initiation that is quite mm -hmm. violent and that entrenches already um, a, a culture of, of, of male domination mm -hmm. uh, also played out through sport. So I'm wondering if um, mm -hmm. you are also factoring in the, the high school mm -hmm particularly yeah. boys' school experience. Yeah, um, and, and it's quite interesting that you bring up the high school element because um, in fact, most of the people that I also interviewed come from these high schools, right? Um, and also because, you know, VETS is also multiracial um, in different um, ethnicities as well. Uh, one of the other things that also came up in my research was, for example, the whole idea of initiation, right? So some of the students I interviewed Kosa, Soto, Pedi, and you know, they went, so some of their tribes or the tribes they fall under also went to initiation, right? So hence, for example, when they come to men's residence, they either conform to the men's residence uh, no, in initiation because they're like, oh, we've been through this, right? This is not something new, right? So we're used to it, right? So the goals and purposes, I agree with Tiffany, they're definitely different, right? But at, at men's res, it, in essence, it's about, you know, creating a particular image of this is who we are, this, we are raiders, we, this is how you define us or differentiate us from the rest of other male residences, because men's residence, you know, is not the only male residence at VITS, right? But how do you define us? You define us by, you know, we are raiders, you know, we are animals, you know, we are going to Bottom line, we chow costs, but we chow black label as well. We do one, two, three, four, five, right? So whilst they are different, but then some of the men, in fact, you know, the, the, some they use some of the similarities from their own backgrounds to, in, in, in effect, become 
you know, the quintessential male um, at, men's, uh, at, at men's res. Um, and one of the things that I also wanted to talk about was the, the question that was asked by, by Dina with regards to the ethical aspects of, of my research, right? And for me, how I navigated, you know, some of those ethical aspects of my research was through my, my, my methodology of autoethnography, right? Um, you know, while I appreciated my own reflection uh, uh, by reflecting on, on my position as a black homosexual male, but then also at the same time, I was quite aware that, you know, I was also an insider to the microcosmos that I intended to study, right? So I also thought about, you know, the, the potential benefits that um, being, a, for example, at the time that I was conducting the research, I was an MA student. So in, in, in men's residence lexicon, I was an ancestor. So as much as I identify as a black homosexual male, right, where, for example, you know, there were certain sections of, there were certain men who, who wouldn't want to speak with me because of my sexuality, but then also I benefited through, for example, such as having access and participant observation, having insider knowledge of the codes and the history of, of men's residence as a place, by you know negotiating those those things in order to have access in, in in essence so as much as you know there were certain challenges that i that i faced in, in relation to my positionality particularly as it related to my sexuality right at the, at the same time as a known insider i didn't ask certain questions i didn't ask innocently or or naively right because you know it I was afraid that it, 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 you know, it, it, it might appear to be forced or you know, unauthentic because I was expected to know given that you know, I was regarded still you know, as, as, an, as an ancestor because of the hierarchy of the residents, right? So my position as black and as same sex identifying you know, was also an advantage with some participants and you know, the very same positionalities also proved to be a disadvantage when I interacted with you know, a black heteronormative male who self-centered as, you know, he assumed that, for example, you know, I, I could, you know, object his views, you know, for example, being homophobic. Uh, yeah. All right. So we've reached the end of um, our panel and uh, from the chat and the audience, there's just gratitude for both of you and your wonderful work and we wish you the best. It's been a pleasure to chair this panel. I am now going to hand over to um, the next panel that is on Healing Waters, Transnational Liberatory Feminist Praxis. Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>